On the southern bank of the River Thames is an area named Southwark. It's over the other side of the river and across the only bridge in the city, London Bridge. In the Middle Ages, it was a land of entertainment with its own rules, a medieval Las Vegas where people would go to watch bear and bull baiting and visit theatres, taverns and brothels. And the person making the most money out of the whole disreputable affair was a high-ranking bishop of the Catholic Church. Life was simpler back in the medieval period. Although you might get struck down by a tooth infection, at least you didn't have to worry about accidentally drunk dialing your ex or finding out that your phone number, address and other personal data was being sold to people to make a profit out of you. Life is more complicated, but it doesn't need to be. I'd like to thank today's sponsor Aura for helping make our lives that bit easier by providing an all-in-one service to help keep you safe online. If you've ever been bored and tried googling yourself, you might have seen your personal information on a public site being sold by data brokers. We don't all have the time to track down every time that happens, but Aura can help by sending requests to make the brokers remove your information. For one affordable price, Aura offers parental controls, password management, data protection, and more. It's made my life so much easier as I don't have to worry about scammers getting hold of my details or those annoying robotic calls. You can try out yourself for two weeks by using my link, aura.com slash medievalmadness, or by clicking the link in the description. And now for today's video, welcome to Medieval Madness. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. The medieval bishops of Winchester had always been particularly formidable. Winchester was seen as the premier city in the Kingdom of Wessex and was home to the royal treasury. When the Anglo-Saxon kingdom was unified into England in the 10th century, the Diocese of Winchester was considered one of the wealthiest in England, and the early bishops wielded great influence. Three bishops of Winchester were papal legates, and nine were also Lord Chancellors to the English monarch, including William of Wickham for King Edward III and William Gifford, who served for both William II and Henry I. The position meant that they were second in command only to the king, to say that they were powerful is putting it mildly. Along with that power came wealth, and owning several huge estates that stretched across the south of England from Somerset to London helps them to accrue a vast fortune. The Bishop's Bonus Part of the Winchester Bishop's estate included a large chunk of land to the south of London, referred to as the Manor of Southwark, and here the Bishop had his own London townhouse of Winchester Palace. Technically, Southwark was in the county of Surrey, so it was outside of the jurisdiction of the capital. But it wasn't under county control either, so it was an area that was free to impose its own rule and taxes, and it became known as the Liberty of Winchester later becoming the Liberty of the Clink because of the Clink prison built there in the 12th century. The name Clink attached itself to the prison possibly because of the Flemish word for latch, which is clink with a K. Or it may have come from the noise made by a blacksmith's hammer when fixing manacles around the wrists and ankles. Either way, the word made it into popular culture and developed into the expression being thrown into the clink. Turning a blind eye a royal command was ordered in 1310 to try and control the sex trade in the capital. All the brothels were closed down and any common women, which is how sex workers were referred to, found within the walls faced a punishment of 40 days in prison. But late in the 14th century, sex work was tolerated as long as it was limited to two areas. The aptly named Cox Lane in Smithfield within the walls and the district of Southwark which was outside of the city. The Christian church has always had an ambiguous relationship with sex. As early as the 4th and 5th century, St. Augustine believed that human sex should only be used to propagate children, and then only when a marriage has taken place. But he considered sex work as a necessary evil to protect respectable women from the lusts of men, saying that, quote, to remove prostitutes would unsettle society because of lusts. The belief was that men were sinful and would corrupt respectable women, possibly even their wives, or worse still, turn to sodomy if they could not visit the odd prostitute and get their sexual desires out of their system. And in the 13th century, the theologian Thomas Aquinas compared sex work to a sewer in a palace, writing that, quote, To take away the cesspool would make the palace become an unclean and evil-smelling place. So, throughout the Middle Ages, engaging in or selling sexual services was punished by the ecclesiastical courts. But when the Bishop of Winchester realised just how profitable those cesspools could be, it was amazing how quickly he turned a blind eye to his church teachings. 
Stews and Screeching During the Middle Ages, brothels were known as stews or stew houses because there used to be bathhouses where people could go to wash and stew in the hot water. It's not surprising that there has always been a link between sex and public bathing, probably due to all those naked bodies hanging around. By 1417, all brothels were banned from anywhere in London and its suburbs because prostitution was thought to be connected to other crimes, citing that quote, "...many grievances, abominations, damages, disturbances, murders, homicides, larcenies, and other common nuisances, by reason and cause of the common resort, harbouring and sojourning, which lewd men and women of bad and evil life have in the stews." This banning of all bordellos within the city meant that any young medieval men on the search for some fun had to take a short walk across London Bridge to find their entertainment. After all, it was where all the best taverns, theatres, and stews were. No matter whether it was night or day, as soon as our eager pleasure seeker stepped off the bridge into Southwark, he would have been swooped upon by a gaggle of prostitutes, all chattering and plying their services and bearing their white breasts. It was this that gave the women their nickname Winchester Geese, and their local landlord being the Bishop of Winchester meant that he was able to allow sex work on his land and profit from the female workers. Shady Standards In a 5th century document titled The Ordinances Touching the Government of the Stewholders in Suffolk under the direction of the Bishop of Winchester, King Henry II of England signed off on 39 rules for running the 18 stews in Suffolk, giving the area special significance and what constituted royal protection. As well as being awarded the right to charge rent, the bishop was expected to keep law and order among the brothels and set fines for breaking any of his rules by the light-tailed housewives of the banks. And the Bishop of Winchester was making a tidy sum from any prostitute or stewkeeper who broke the rules of his ordinances. His rules covered everything from where a sex worker or single woman could sleep to what she could wear. Brothel keepers had to be men. They could be accompanied by their wives, but no unmarried women were allowed to run a stew house. Stews could only be opened between certain times on holy days, when the women had to leave not just the brothel, but the entire Lordship of Southwark. No sex work was allowed at night when Parliament was sitting. Every woman had to pay 14 pence to rent her workroom, which was much higher than the going rate, and she was forbidden from dressing like a, quote, good and noble lady, so she was not allowed to wear an apron. Some of the fines were meant to protect the sex workers from exploitation, the brothel keeper was not allowed to lend them money of, quote, more than six shillings and eight pence, or beat them. And, quote, women who lived by their bodies were not allowed to sleep in the stews, and owners were fined 20 shillings if they allowed this, and up to 100 shillings for forcibly keeping them there. Of course, there were lots of examples of rule breaking. Nicholas Croke forced Christiana Swino to stay in a Suffolk stew for nine days. And in 1439, Margaret Hathwick made arrangements with a certain gentleman for a young girl named Isabella Lane to be forcibly kept in one of the brothels for four days to, quote, be used in lustful acts. The customer is always king. There were also rules to protect the customers. Women were prohibited from throwing stones in the River Thames to attract a passing boatman's attention. They were not allowed to pull faces or to draw any man by his gown or by his hood, to try and drag him into the stew unless they wanted a fine of 20 shillings. A brothel owner could also be fined 20 shillings for holding, quote, any man against his will within his house is a prisoner for any debt that he owes. Any woman found to be suffering from a horrible disease, such as the sickness of burning, which we can assume to be gonorrhea, would be permanently banished from the stews. One of the harshest punishments was aimed at any woman who took a boyfriend if it was her intention to financially support him, what we would now call a pimp. For that transgression, she would be given three weeks in jail, a fine of six shillings, a session on the cooking stool, and banishment from the Suffolk area. Oh, and if any owner were to let a nun, nor any man's wife, work in his stew, he would be fined 14 pence. This seems pretty lenient, really, for anyone going around and abducting nuns, but it was clearly a thing to necessitate this rule. The Outcast Dead In Suffolk today, there is a medieval burial ground just a short walk away from London Bridge with close links to the Winchester Geese. It's called the Crossbones Graveyard and stayed in use up until the 19th century. When sex workers died, they were not permitted to be buried on consecrated ground because of church law. 
It's thought that the Bishop of Winchester set aside a piece of land where they could be interred there in Suffolk along with unbaptized babies and any other religious outcasts, such as those that had been excommunicated. It seems both hypocritical and sad that the Winchester geese would have worked by license of the bishop and made him quite a lot of cash, but they weren't thought to be deserving of a place in heaven or even fit enough to be given a Christian burial. In John Stiles' survey of London, written in 1598, the cemetery is mentioned as a single woman's churchyard, single woman being a euphemism for a sex worker. By the mid-18th century, the graveyard was used as a pauper burying ground and up to 15,000 people are thought to have been interred there. It was closed in 1853 because it was so packed that bodies were being buried in shallow graves, on top of other coffins, and it was completely overcharged with dead. It was King Henry VIII who finally ordered that all brothels should be closed down in 1546, even the ones in Suffolk, for reasons of morality, says the guy who had six wives. There was a raging syphilis epidemic at the time, and Henry was a known germaphobe who evacuated London whenever any disease hit the capital, so that probably fueled his paranoia. But of course, prostitution in London didn't end, it simply went underground, and the brothel owners moved to other, more inconspicuous areas across the city. A lot went to Petticoat Lane, Cox Lane, and I need to make sure that the text is on screen for this one, Grope Cunt Lane in Cheapside. Although Suffolk still continued to be known as a place of vice. At Crossbones today, the dead are honoured by the hundreds of messages, flowers, ribbons and tokens that are tied to the cemetery gates, and a short memorial service is held once a month in the early evening. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you next week for another video. Have a great week. Cheers!